joining us this evening uh, for a wonderful conversation with author Jennifer DeLeon, author of Don't Ask Me Where I'm From. Um, so as a note to the audience tonight, we will be recording this session. Uh, so please be mindful of that. Uh, so we will share with folks who are unable to attend later. Um, we also um, will be dropping in the chat feature the link to uh, Politics and Prose, which is so gracious this evening to be able to um, work with Jen and um, her book to be able to sell copies of her book this evening. So if you're interested in purchasing that, um, that will be in the chat. Um, and we'll remind folks at the end of this um, event as well. Um, so this conversation over the next hour will be a moderated conversation between um, some AUX students, AU students, and Jennifer as the author of the book. Um, so please, if you have any questions, we encourage you to jot those down and put them in the chat or in the question answer feature. We'll be collecting those so we can ask some questions towards the um, later half of this program. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce our moderators for this evening. I have the pleasure of working with both of these students um, through the AUX program. Um, so let me first introduce Bernadette Itzkow. Um, Bernadette is my current um, AUX facilitator for AUX1, so shout out to anybody who is a part of our class this evening. Um, but Bernadette um, is a student in SIS. She is concentrating in international studies with a specific concentration in uh, justice, ethics, and human rights. And she also is minoring and receiving a translator certificate in Spanish language. Uh, Bernadette comes to us from or around the Chicago area. So welcome, Bernadette. The other moderator for this discussion is Stephanie Mejia. Uh, she is also part of SIS, International Studies, with the concentration in peace, global security, and conflict resolution, and a regional focus in South and Central Asia. Uh, her minor is in Asian Studies, and Stephanie is a proud Dominican and Honduranian born and raised from New Jersey. So welcome, Stephanie. So excited for you both to be taking the lead with moderating this conversation. Um, I personally have a tie to this author as she is my sister. Um, so very excited to welcome her to the AU community. So without further ado, I will kick it off to Bernadette and Stephanie to moderate. Thank you so much for such a wonderful introduction. We are so, so excited and honored to have Jennifer De Leon with us today. I'm gonna to share her bio really quick. So Jennifer De Leon is the author of Don't Ask Me Where I'm From and the editor of Wise Latinas, an assistant professor of creative writing at Framingham State University and a Grub Street instructor and a board member. She has published prose in over a dozen literary journals, including Plowshares, Iowa Review, and Michigan Quarterly Review. Her essay collection, White Space, Essays on Culture, Race, and Writing, is the recipient of the Juniper Prize and will be published by UMass Press in spring 2021, which is so exciting. She lives outside of Boston with her husband and two sons. I'm gonna kick this over to Steph. Um, Jennifer's novel, Don't Ask Me Where I'm From, is the story of a first-generation American Latinx, Liliana Cruz, does what it takes to fit in at her new and nearly all-white school. But when family secrets spill out and racism at school ramps up, she must decide what she believes in and takes a stand. Um, we are extremely lucky to have Jennifer with us today, who is also willing to share a passage with us from her novel and have a discussion with us today. Jennifer, would you like to share something with us? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I um, just want to thank American University and specifically the AU Experience Programming Team and the First Year Advising um, and their whole affinity programming team, specifically Izzy Stern, and then of course you, Stephanie Mejia and Bernadette Itzkow, and um, the one and only Caroline De Leon, my sister, my younger sister, um, it's funny, you know, growing up, we used to play so much and playing talk show was something that we used to do. And now I feel like, oh my God, we're having a real live talk show and we don't have to pretend anymore. Um, but I am so grateful to be here. Thank you for the invitation and for making me feel so welcome. Don't Ask Me Where I'm From um, is the book that I really needed as a young person. And it's the book that I wish I could 
have handed to my students when I was a teacher in Boston Public Schools for over 10 years. So it's, it's definitely dear to me. And um, it's also a book that I hope really kind of provides um, windows um, and mirrors to different readers, right? So for some readers, they might see themselves in the story, in Liliana, in the characters. And for other readers, they might be new to these circumstances or this situation, and they might see it as a window into some whole new world. So if it can achieve that for readers, I would feel like my work is done. Um, but so in light of that, I thought I would read a scene that comes later in the book. And I know you um, described the book, but just to recap, Liliana is 15 years old and she is trying to fit in at her new high school in Westburg. She's part of a program called MECO, which is basically a desegregation program, which means that she takes a bus from the city to the suburbs every morning, like an hour, um, in order to attend a quote unquote better school. And so while she's there, she is really one of only a few students of color and she is um, kind of shy in class um, until this moment. So I'll, I'll read this scene. For homework in Mr. Phelps' class, we'd read an article on the subject of intersecting languages in the modern world. Now he was asking what we thought about a multilingual society, what the benefits and drawbacks of it were for any nation. As usual, he glanced meaningfully at me. As usual, my heart was beating fast. But this time, it wasn't because I didn't want to share. It was because I did. But I didn't raise my hand just yet. One girl, Erin, also the class president, did though. Mr. Phelps, seriously? Is that a comment, Erin? I'm just saying, this is America and all, and we speak English. So anyone who comes to this country should learn English. I mean, it's not a crazy idea. That's our language. Like if I went to Russia, I'd be expected to speak Russian, right? I wouldn't expect Russians to all learn English because I was there. I kicked at my chair leg. Here we freaking go again. Erin adjusted her hairband. She must have really loved those things. She wore a different color like every day. Today's was lavender and she still had a tan left over from wherever her family had gone for Thanksgiving. Who goes away for Thanksgiving? Isn't the whole point to stuff yourself with turkey and mashed potatoes and pie and wear sweaters and watch movies with your cousins? Well, now Erin squared her shoulders, not done. I'm just saying that it's one thing if you want to speak more than one language, but shouldn't everyone be expected to speak English in the US? A guy named Andrew called out, you're just pissed because you probably suck at foreign languages. Take Spanish with Senorita Kim. She's so easy. She plays movies and soap operas or whatever, like every day. A couple of kids laughed. I kept kicking at my chair leg. Andrew, Aaron looked Andrew square in the eye. Whatever. This girl named Sarah chimed in. She had gorgeous hair, like down to her butt. I think she was growing it out to donate to cancer or something. You know, Erin has a point. When my family and I went on safari in Zimbabwe and Kenya last year, we had to learn like 10 words in Shona and another 10 in Swahili. Oh my God, a guy in the back muttered. That must have been exhausting. I laughed, I couldn't help it. Mistake, Phelps pounced. Miss Cruz, do you have something to contribute to the discussion? I took my hands out of my pockets. Something to contribute? Yes but I knew that if I spoke up, I'd have like 40 eyes on me, like I was a representative of all Spanish speaking people in the friggin' universe. So I shook my head, pass. Mr. Phelps, looked, Mr. Phelps looked disappointed. Anyone else, he asked. You know what I hate, Aaron's BFF Kate called out. What's that? Mr. Phelps sat back on his stool. How Spanish is taking over TV. Now Mr. Phelps folded his arms, I'm not following. Kate looked exasperated. You know how sometimes there are lines or jokes that are in Spanish in shows and I'm expected to understand them without subtitles? Yeah, mm-hmm, yep, oh yeah. So many kids agreed with her, I couldn't believe it. Erin's hand shot back up. Mr. Phelps eyed the clock. Yes, Erin? 
it happens in music too. Like every time I stream music, there's always something with lyrics in Spanish. Despacito, anyone? It's so annoying. My left knee started bouncing. What, were we an inconvenience, annoyance? I couldn't take it anymore. So, um, excuse me, boom, 40 eyes on me, called it. Miss Cruz, I cleared my throat. Yeah, so are you all even aware that, I mean, the word Florida, Florida means flowery in Spanish and that Colorado, Colorado means red or red colored. These are words in Spanish because the Spanish were actually here before the English, I'm just saying. The last part I had read about in our textbook, so I kind of thought I deserved extra credit, no lie. Dead silence. I could hear the clock ticking on the wall. Then one kid in the front row said, I'm hip. I almost slid out of my chair. It was a Cambodian kid. I'd never heard him talk before. Thank you, Miss Cruz, Mr. Phelps was saying. You raise an excellent point. Then I remembered something else and out came, yeah. And the border of Mexico and the United States used to be different before. Like Mexico actually included the states of Arizona and New Mexico and parts of Texas and California. I'd read that in one of the books from Mr. Phelps' shelf. Actually, I should remember to use that info for a slide for the assembly. Mr. Phelps nodded. This time, I didn't care how many eyes were on me. I really didn't. But then Aaron said, all snippy. Yeah, well, that's not the case now. Well, I jumped on with this capital A attitude, I'll admit. I'm just saying that, yeah, you may feel annoyed having to press one for English or whatever, but imagine how annoyed you'd be if someone came and kicked you off your own land and told you that your language, food, culture, everything was wrong and you had to change it or die. That's messed up. That's annoying, right? The class blew up. Oh, boom, she told you, Erin. I couldn't tell what Erin was thinking. She began reapplying lip balm in slow motion, but then all of a sudden she stood and ran out of the classroom. Her face looked on the verge of crumbling. Mr. Phelps hopped off the stool. All right, everyone, uh, take out your notebooks, write a paragraph reflection, I'll, I'll be right back. Here's what I wrote. Oh, great. Now I am going to be labeled the angry Latina who told off the blonde white girl. See, this is why I never say anything in class. I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. I very clearly remember reading that passage and feeling super angry, but also super amped up and being able to definitely relate to that, especially going to PWIs just as Liliana had done. Um, I wanted to ask you, could you talk a little bit about how your writing intersects with your teaching and how they really inform each other and even what, um, yeah, could you talk of that, please? <laughs> Definitely. No, I mean, writing the characters of the teachers, I felt like I could draw on my own experiences teaching um, middle school, high school, college. Um, but I also really tried to draw on my experience as a student. Like, I have been Liliana, especially in that moment. Mm -hmm. where it's like whoa you got 40 eyes on you like what do you have to say like you're the representative of all latinx people on the planet and it's like i'm trying to learn too like i did the homework like everybody else i'm just trying to figure out you know what what i need to know and and i have questions too so um for me writing this scene and this book really um i felt like i was constantly at that crux like that intersection between teaching and then um, being a student for, for so long. And I wanted to hopefully show a real scene, real scenes where students say what they really say and think what they really think, you know, like I'm, I'm not, I wasn't trying to paint a cookie cutter version of a classroom. I wanted, um, I wanted student voices in there as much as possible. So yeah, teaching and writing for me have, have often intersected. Um, Steph and I were actually discussing earlier how alive your characters feel and how it's so wonderful to read because it feels like you're really in the moment. And you touched upon this a moment ago, but you mentioned that your own experiences really informed the characters and the way they were developed. I was curious as to whether you would be able to speak to where you really see yourself in these characters, particularly um, maybe the main character, Liliana. Yes, definitely. Thank you for that great question. I mean. Liliana, um, people will ask me, 
especially like younger students, they're like, so you're Liliana, right? <laughs> I'm like, well, I mean, we both obviously like pink, so. <laughs> But really, um, you know, I didn't do a, the MECO program. I wasn't part of a desegregation program, but I definitely um, felt like Liliana in terms of um, constantly navigating two worlds and going back and forth and never really feeling like I fully belonged in either one. So I grew up in a suburb of Boston and during the week, I was like white girl gen, like all the students in my class were white, all the teachers were white. And I just, every activity I did, whether going to the library or Girl Scouts, that was just my reality. And then on the weekends, uh, my family and I would often go to Boston, to Jamaica Plain, and we'd hang out with our cousins and our tias and it just was a different uh, experience. And, and not one was better or worse or good or bad. It just, it, it's almost like um, I was a chameleon. Like every place I went to, I tried to fit in to whoever was around me. But like I said, it didn't always work. Like my cousins were like, why do you talk like a white girl? You know, and <laughs> all these kinds of things, it's true. And then, you know, they'd say like, you're always writing in a journal. You always have a book. Like, why are you trying to act white? You know. And, and even from a young age, I would say to them, so what? Like reading and writing just belongs to white people. Like nobody else can do that or they're acting white. So I feel like my activism and all these kinds of questions um, started sprouting from, from a young age. No, for sure. And I, I thank you for your honesty and candor when, when talking about this. And, you know, Liliana has a lot of characteristics that I'm starting to see in you, like her aspirations for writing and um, also her experience with being in the library and writing and wanting to be a part of these different groups. But um, you have also been a Boston Public Library writer in residence, not the same thing as Liliana, but similar. Um, but could you tell us about how that experience shaped your writing as well? Definitely. And I'm, I'm glad you're asking this because this is something I didn't know about um, really until somewhat recently in my life and my career. Um, there are residencies and fellowships that sometimes libraries have, sometimes universities, sometimes institutions, and they give you money to write. <laughs> it's like, wait, what? Rewind, you know? <laughs> so I basically heard about this residency and I applied and you get $20,000 and your own office and a key to the office <laughs> for nine months. And so once I, I got that residency, I felt like the world was giving me permission to write the book. Mm -hmm. And I did, I went to work, you know, multiple times a week. And I went to that office and I was like, this is my work, this is my writing. And the fellowship allowed me to not teach as much, you know what I mean? So it would supplement the income. Mm -hmm. um, but it more than the money, it was just the validation of a committee saying your story matters. And of course, because I was in the library, if I felt inspired or somebody mentioned a book I should check out, I, I literally walked down the hall and had like all these books at the ready. So I felt like it was symbolic too, you know, and, um, and libraries are, are, libraries are the best. They're free and they're, <laughs> I don't know, I still can't get over like how magnificent libraries are. Mm -hmm. Oh, that sounds like such a wonderful and incredible opportunity, especially since it sounds like this was really the birthplace of where you started your book, which is incredible. So um, your book was actually published this past August. Congratulations. <laughs> um, but what current events, if any, inspired or influenced your story? Where does that writing story really come to fruition? Yep, yep, definitely. Um, this story is contemporary, probably more so than I would have realized when I started it um, five years ago. And once, you know, I never name the, the president in the book. Um, I felt like I wanted this book to be situated in a space and time, but at the same time be universal and maybe it, it can relate to many periods in history. And I do quote him though, where um, at one point, Mr. Phelps puts a quote up on the whiteboard and you know the quote is like, Mexicans are only coming to this country um, 
because you know they're they're bringing they're rapists and they're bringing crime and drugs and like this horrible quote. Mm-hmm. And I remember reading it in the news and hearing it and being like, that can't be real. Like this is what the leader of the nation is saying about these. I hope I can swear on here these shithole countries. It's like how is that possible? And at the time, I had uh, a draft of the novel, but at, at that point, I just felt like I had to press the gas. I had to finish this thing and get it out in the world. And, you know, here we are. The book just came out at the end of August, and we're, we're at this crossroads again. So I feel like I hope students and readers in general can, can read it and, and learn something, take something from it, and maybe it inspires them to, to vote, to, to, you know, be active in some way that counters um, the garbage that, that's being s- spread and shared. Mm-hmm. No, for sure. And I think you bring about a, a great message that we don't always talk about and we see in the news and it's always good to have a novel or to have some type of counter reaction to something like this. But to build on further what you started talking about, um, so your book follows Liliana or Lily, as, he, as some people called her in the book. But um, through some challenging and difficult times with family, school, and friends, um, many of those interactions reveal and comment on racism in America today. Um, and how did you feel writing about that? Did you feel daring? Did you feel like it was necessary? And also, what responses did you have from the public? Yeah, I definitely, um, you should have seen earlier drafts because I think I had Liliana a lot angrier and a lot um of my own like agenda in the narrative and my amazing editor would point those places out to me and say like okay all right there's like jen the author and the teacher um and then there's the character and you really have to stay true to the character Mm -hmm. and that's not to say she can't be having these thoughts and thinking this way but it's got to come from her so Mm -hmm. she kind of helped me like scrub the manuscript (laughs) with um and you know give it like a nice yeah, nice scrub, nice loofah, like, you know, just kind of get it like ready so that it, it felt authentic. And um, I could use the occasion of the novel, like the project of the book mm-hmm. to then spin off and pivot and talk about lots of issues, which is what I've been doing, um, and especially during school visits or virtual, of course, um, students will, will say, you know, I, I didn't know any of this like a lot of it like I didn't know that we needed desegregation programs I didn't know that this might be the experience of Latinx people at my my high school mm-hmm. and um you know Liliana in the book she's she's one person she's one character um I'm not trying to have her represent all Latinx 15 year old teenagers right it's no but I I do think that I can tell a true story even if in fiction. And by painting her as a real nuanced 360 degree like character that hopefully people will remember her. And when we remember parts of the book, like we'll remember the story and the emotional parts. We don't, our brains aren't wired to necessarily remember like facts or statistics. Mm-hmm. We're, we're wired to remember emotional um, points. So that's why I'm drawn to story in general, but I love when readers are like, I legit didn't even know about, about this. And, mm-hmm. and just the fact that reading a novel can help them, um, you know, grow in that way. I feel like this is such a privilege to be able to do this for work. Writing is honestly just such a wonderful gift to give to people to be able to learn so much more. Like personally, I had no idea what Metco was until I read that description in your book. That was really enlightening. And what you mentioned before, creating such a nuanced character, I found it really interesting how throughout your work, you actually used food and drink throughout the novel to reflect um, Liliana's cultural multitudes. Um, <laughs> such as her mom's capital O obsession with Vietnamese food. That was wonderful. Um, Especially those that perhaps subvert readers' expectations about Latin American families and narratives. Would you be able to comment on those choices in terms of Lily's culture? Was there intention there? Could this possibly have been influenced by your own cultural life experiences? Yeah, I mean, I studied abroad in Vietnam for a semester. So I have, um, I don't know, I, I felt like why, in the same way that I might ask myself, like, yeah, why couldn't I study abroad in Vietnam? Like, 
you know, like I think Stephanie, you're, you're major minoring in Asian studies or you have a focus, right? I feel like yeah. you're great. Like, <laughs> you be like pigeonholed into like, oh, you have to study this or that. Like I studied French. I, I did things that I feel like do subvert people's expectations of like the Latina yes. experience or role, you know? And um, so I tried to do that in the book where, yeah, her mom loves Vietnamese food. And I also really, um, you know, outside of food, I wanted to kind of uh, subvert expectations in the sense that I didn't want to um, have them fall into this trope or this idea of um, the danger of the single story. And there's this amazing TED talk, I'm sure you've seen it, um, <laughs> by yes, yeah. Amanda yep. and, mm -hmm. and, you know, she shares how stereotypes aren't, um, aren't bad in the sense that they're not true. They're just, they're, they're one of many stories. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like this is an opportunity in this novel to depict characters that are Latinx, but have them be um, like challenging that single story and having a real variety, like imagine that, right, of, of people. And so, for example, her father, um, I think the stereotype of Latino fathers sometimes is that they're not really invested in their kids education or they don't go to school events or they're not even in the picture necessarily. And when you watch some of um, movies or film like sometimes you'll see that. And so I wanted Liliana's father to tell a different story and he is super involved in her life and her schooling. He takes her to a charter school lottery when she's 10 years old, right? It's like He's always trying to get the deals at the museums, like, oh, we get in on, we get in free the first Sunday every month, like these kinds of things um, to provide a counter narrative, right? Because if all you're consuming passively are the headlines on the news and social media and everything, then you're really kind of only getting certain aspects of the story. Like, so I felt like, all right, the least I can do is to put something else down and, and, and give another perspective. Yes, no, for sure. And I think you actually, the talk that you brought up, we actually show in one of our classes as well. And I remember um, working with Caroline last semester, there were times where um, she'd bring in all these TED Talks, but also as well as the second part of the AUX curriculum, which really, focuses, which really focuses on anti-racism, um, oppression, inequality in sorts, and conversations like that. And you do touch on those within the book as well. Um, in the town of Westburg, um, the characters, like Bernie has mentioned before, are alive and the narrative is beautiful. And I really appreciate how you're bringing into this community of Latinidad that it's not just about speaking Spanish, it's not just about um, the food and culture, and it's not this false narrative that you're talking about, which I truly appreciate. And that's something that I've been keeping in mind with things that I study. And I know tons of other Latinos who um, feel affinity with the identity, but also feel as though there's more to us than just what the news is saying. Um, but yes, so like I mentioned, your book really does touch on different um, ideas about anti-racism. And there's one particular event that I remember where um, Lily comments to the black character, the black basketball player in the book, Ray Sean, um, this is what she says to him, says in the book, Ray Sean was their entertainment and they held the remote control. Um, and this pertains to um, him playing basketball and the derogatory um, side notes that some people would make to him. But could you comment on representation as an author and educator, um, particularly being a woman um, of Latino descent and how do events like the one Rayshawn experiences um, show up in PWIs like American University and PWIs that you and your sister had gone to as well? Yeah, yeah. that's such a thoughtful question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I love hearing your, your comments and, and I, I, I want to hear your stories like so bad. So feel free to, you know, share your, your anecdotes and your experiences and even um, specific moments in the book that maybe you connected to. Like this is, this is um, really special and valuable for me and, and like an honor to hear readers' experiences firsthand. But, you know, I, I definitely, the college I attended was PWI, graduate school, all this. And um, one of the um, 
well, I should say that, you know, the, in the book, um, Rayshawn, who is um, in Mecco, and he is, like Liliana, he is one of the few students of color at the school, and at, he's also a star basketball player. Mm -hmm. And at one point, he gets chosen for, um, I think, captain or the, a, a great position to start or something. Literally, I don't know that much about sports, okay? And um, so <laughs> people get mad, and someone, I mean, this isn't only somebody drawing a mustache on his picture on a flyer, right? Mm -hmm. Like those things happen. This is someone in the book who, at the school who took um, his face and um, photoshopped a noose around his neck and shared it on social media. And mm -hmm. so this is a hate crime. And this happens in the book and something similar happens to Liliana later where someone posts a picture of her head on a piñata, a piñata, and, and writes the words, you know, go back where you're from. And so these are overt examples, but of course they're in addition to the many microaggressions, um, which Ibram Kendi doesn't even like calling microaggressions. He says they're, they're right, like call it what it is. They're racist crimes, they're racist acts. And so regardless of the, the language for a second, you know, all of this is so, I don't have to tell you, right? It's so taxing on yes. a person of color who's trying to navigate the world. They, they have this dual consciousness, like Du Bois says, right? It's like you're living in one world, but then you're also processing through another world. That's exhausting to be code switching, like on the daily, like on the, on a minute by minute basis. And, um, and so I think for the, the characters in the book, like they just, they've had it, they've had it. And I know so many students sadly feel the same way. Um, so what can be done? You know, I think getting these conversations are not going because I know they're happening, but I think um, well, if they're not, they should be. But it, then also having them continue having these spaces where we can talk about this. I do think it's easier when you're talking about characters in a book and you're like, well, Liliana feels this way, you know what I mean? Versus like, mm -hmm. I feel this way because it's hard. It's hard work and you don't you have to be vulnerable. Um, but there is this kind of um, consumerism that I feel like happens with um, students of color and with Rayshawn. He's like the star basketball player and the teachers like try to think they're like down with him and like give him high fives and like, yeah, Rayshawn. And like Liliana's just noticing all this and in class, he's super quiet, he sits in the back, he's got his head like under his hood. Mm -hmm. And then the second he goes in the hallway, he starts like fake playing basketball and everybody's like, Rayshawn, Rayshawn. Mm -hmm. and, and she notices like, wow, he's like performing for them. And this is problematic. And Liliana doesn't have the language yet maybe to understand this, but she's starting to notice all of these like moments. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, People ask me if I'll write a sequel or maybe write her like her senior year. And I'm like, mm -hmm. maybe. And I just kind of like, cause it's, a, it's like the story continues beyond the last page of the book, yeah. um, her journey certainly. But anyway, there's a long winded answer because it's just <laughs> a, an important topic, you know, like we're not meant to be culturally appropriated or consumed. Like it's just not okay. Thank you so much for such a candid and impactful response. It's absolutely true that these conversations are often easier had in the abstract, which is also such a difficult thing to overcome. And I'm hoping that AUX becomes a space where we can really start to address a lot of these um, ideas, this consumerism, this tokenization as well, um, along the lines of that. I can't help but see aspects of Lily's story as in active anti-racism playbook illustrating for white educators and peer advocates how not to approach, treat, or instruct students of color. I'm wondering if you had that audience in mind while writing um, Don't Ask Me Where I'm From, where now that I think about it is a very instruction, like instructional title. Yeah. I hate being asked, where are you from? Or like, where are you actually from? Right, yeah, where are you? really from mm -hmm. um where are you from from you know all these kinds of variations and 
she gets, she's on the receiving end of that question, right, throughout the book, and especially when she's um, starting at Westberg, people want to, like, figure her out, you know, they want to put her in a box, like, pin her down, like, wait, and the, the truth is, you know, she has lots of answers to that question, um, but what they're doing it in the way, the way that question is asked is just as important as the words themselves, right, because it's like, it could be a beautiful question, like, tell me more about your background, like, we want to connect, we want to share, like, everybody is from somewhere, right, but the way that she's being asked, like, where are you from, like, where are you really from, you know, it's like they're otherizing her, and they're making her feel different, and um, like, different is bad, and so she hadn't had that experience up until Westburg because she lived in Boston, and she went to schools where everybody looked and talked, and like, they had similar cultural backgrounds, and so, so she's a fish out of water in this way, and um, what happens in the book is that she does this icebreaker activity with a writing group, and the instructor says, you know, write a six-word memoir, mm -hmm. and so she thinks, you know, what can I write, what can I write, and then she comes up with, don't ask me where I'm from. So that's her six word memoir. And once I wrote that scene, I felt like that's the title. That's the title of the book. <laughs> um, it just, it has to be there. And um, people who know, know, you know? <laughs> yeah. no, no, no. People who know, know, know exactly what people you mean. Know, know. Yeah, they give me the head <laughs> or they'll write me on Instagram or something like that title though. And I'm mm -hmm. like, yep. No, I, no. I was listening to the audiobook. I was in, giant. I was talking to Bernie about this and I was listening to the book. I was picking up a, blo a box of sparkling water. I was picking up LaCroix or something. Yeah. And I was listening to the book to refresh myself after having to read it, after reading it this summer because yeah. Caroline was amazing That's and sent it to me. Yeah. Um, and so I was in just this aisle and I hear these derogatory terms and we get to this point in the book and it just settles with me. And it feels so good to be able to own that racism, own what that felt like and say, no, this is not what defines me and I'm going to keep pushing forward. And there are definitely themes about staying hidden within the book and definitely themes about having to survive within a PWI. But, you know, Liliana really pursues through that and she does it um, with all the other POCs in her school and it takes some time for her to do that. But no, definitely. Um, I want to ask you so many more questions, but I know um, that we have, we might possibly have some questions from the audience. If anybody wants to send some in now, they're welcome. Um, and as that's happening, I do want to actually follow up with this idea of staying, staying hidden. But um, Bernie and I were talking about how impressed we were throughout this novel by the way you seem to represent the complex idea of staying hidden and that it's this kind of tool, tool of survival, like I was saying. And as much as it can be things that threaten you to destroy you. I think of the information that Lily's parents um, kind of hide from her and also the heart rendering moments that Lily shoves a certain book into her backpack. Mm -hmm. um, and not because she had to hide it, but because it was just easier to do that. Mm -hmm. So what do you think the message was? Um, and what was the message that you wanted to send here about hiding and also revealing in a sense as well? Right, right. Yeah, it's so complicated. And I just, I'm so grateful for you. You guys read the book, like, <laughs> for real, for real. Um, and it just is so great to hear these details and the nuances, because as a writer, it, it's, there are many drafts, you know, and a lot of these details don't kind of come in until later. And then you just try to like weave everything together. And it's hard. It's a whole process. Um, but I felt like um, that was important to me to have that in there. Um, because not only are you code switching, you're constantly making little and big decisions on what to hide, what to reveal. Mm -hmm. And um, I definitely relate to that. You know, I'd, I'd be curious to hear um, if, if you all have that experience too and, and how and, and how, you, how you make those decisions and, and based on what and how that's changed in your own lives too. Because like she is still young, right? She's a ninth grader. And at one point she, she has her new friend, Holly from Westburg come over to her apartment and she cleans her room and she kind of tried to get rid of some stuff that she thought would be embarrassing. 
And it's like, well, what is embarrassing? Like, you know, is it stuff about your culture? Is it stuff about your family? Is it stuff about you? Like, Liliana likes making these um, little miniatures, you know, out of cardboard. And then she shoves them under her bed because she thinks Holly's going to judge her and think that's like little kid stuff, you know, or like what, she's too poor. She can't go to an art supply store and get real art supplies. So she's got to use like cardboard boxes and cereal boxes. Um, so it's just something where, um, yeah, you're constantly having to make these decisions. Um, I wanted, I guess, um, like I was saying at the beginning, you know, to have a mirror. So, so for some readers could be like, yep, I've done that too. Or like, <laughs> oh my God, yeah, I know that feeling. Mm -hmm. But also like for educators too, um, or just adults who maybe can reflect on their own experiences, but definitely teachers, you know, I wanted teachers to see like, oh, you know, again, not all my Latinx students, but many might have similar experiences to Liliana. And um, I, I should respect that. And I should kind of consider her whole experience and, um, you know, I, I love that the book has been picked up um, at some schools as a, um, like an all class read or an all grade read, but, but also with teachers um, and staff, because I think it's a great book club book for them to discuss and learn about their own students um, in ways that they maybe haven't had access to before. So, yeah. yeah uh, I'm dying to hear from you, like, while we're waiting for <laughs> questions, yeah. Yeah, that notion of relatability, I think particularly that theme of what is hidden and what is revealed um, was something that resonated quite a bit with me throughout your book, particularly as um, a Latina that presents very white and has a very white name. Oftentimes um, in the white spaces that I'll enter, people will say things that are definitely not appropriate or derogatory. And I will have to be the person that's just like, hey, that's inappropriate. You can't say that. And then they'll ask me if I have a stake in that. And it's like, well, generally, why would I, number one, why would I have to have a stake in that to just be a good person? Yes. I guess. Like, how do you, <laughs> how do you have, why do you have to justify something like that? And I think that um, kind of relates a little bit to one of the questions that we just got in. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what it means to be anti-racist and how you use that lens while writing and teaching? Yeah. Oh my goodness. We could have a whole other session on this, right? <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I love that you share that. That's an example, right? Of being anti-racist is speaking up and speaking out and not letting these moments pass because it's easier because it is easier. You know, if you just kind of pretend you didn't hear it or you, like walk across the room or you mute the person if you're on zoom or something you know it's <laughs> like okay that is easier um but being anti-racist is doing the harder thing um but, or i shouldn't even say harder it's just doing the right thing it's doing the, the the active thing which is speaking up and and providing another perspective i think so much of racism comes from having been only exposed to the single story, you know, and if we have other narratives, um, then we can understand on a fundamental level, like that there are, there's a multitude of experiences and there's not just, we don't make these quick associations, like black people are this, Asian people are this, Latinx people are this, you know, and so I also always will go to storytelling as um, a way of being anti-racist and and you know, look at your bookshelf, examine it. Um, what's on your kid's bookshelf? Um, you know, what, what are you doing on a daily basis, on a small level, on a big level to push this anti-racism um, action forward? You know, and in terms of like anti-racist pedagogy, because I'm thinking like as a teacher, you know, mm -hmm. it's looking at your syllabus and you know, um, also having this space in your classroom where it's not like coming from the professor, I shall like impart knowledge on you, the students. It's a shared space like um, where we have collective knowledge and I'm there more as a facilitator. 
Um, a lot of people don't understand how this relates to being anti-racist, um, but the, the brief version is to just say like everybody has agency and everybody has something to bring to the collective goal, I guess, you know, and, um, and so the other thing too is like not making assumptions that everybody understands um, terms of higher education that have been grounded and steeped and perpetuated by whiteness, um, office hours, um, you know, it, exams, like the, the culture of higher education is very white and very privileged. And so I think sometimes um, people don't want to change, but you got to change for progress and for, um, you know, equality and justice. And so it's, it can get uncomfortable. Um, but I think the first step is, is having more uh, transparency and then having more opportunities where, where we can share more of our stories. Because I really, really feel like if, if people understood more about our, our backgrounds and our stories, what we want to share, that we'd really find more common ground than difference. Thank you. That was very beautifully put. And I think for me, when we're talking about anti-racism acts, you know, we do help with this class as well, facilitating AUX2, but also what's been currently happening in the news, especially over the summer with the BLM um, marches, the protests and stuff like that. And, you know, um, fighting anti-racism doesn't just mean fighting for your race, doesn't mean fighting for only your identities, but also supporting multiple people. And you see that with um, the multitude of the different identities that you do discuss within the book, which I truly appreciate. Um, and just talking about how happy you are and the joy that's brought to you um, and having this conversation with us. What are other things in the writing process that do bring you joy and that you also find in your Latino culture? Yeah. Oh my goodness. I mean, so much, but I will tell you, this is bringing me such joy right now. <laughs> I mean, you're the future. You're like, these like strong, powerful, like incredible Latinx, you know, Latina women. And it's just, <laughs> to me like this this is so incredible this is so incredible you know not to say that i'm surprised i'm not surprised i'm i'm honored that we're having this conversation and that you're just so great at formulating these questions and, and making them conversational like you guys should have a show i think you should have a, show. <laughs> you should have a podcast you should have a, a a web show something um because it's just it's so great to be to have these conversations and to be able to, to like, I guess, let other people like listen in. <laughs> I don't know how many people are on here, but, but even if it were just the three of us, you know, it feels like this is what fills me up. This is what gives me joy. It fills my tank. It fills my well. It makes me <laughs> feel like, okay, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this again tomorrow. Like, I'm going to go back to the blank page, face the blinking cursor. I have more stories to tell. And, um, I feel a, a urgency, you know, like, but also um, a privilege, a responsibility, like that I get to wake up and look forward to my day. And that day includes writing and teaching and, and having these conversations. To, that's a, a real marker of success, right? Is like waking up and looking forward to your day. So I'm just so thrilled for you. And I want to know like, keep in touch I want to know everything <laughs> to help in any way I can because that's the other thing it's like we're stronger together I think more Latina collectives mm -hmm. are needed more affinity groups more um, resources and funding and and I mean beyond pizza like I'm being real you know like I had funded internships and those are the things that really made a difference you know um, and I could tell you stories about that too <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you so much for such candid and honest and vulnerable responses. It's been so absolutely wonderful speaking to you about your book and everything that you explored in your book. Just, I wish I could articulate that further. It's so wonderful. I think also in particular, um, the emphasis on intersectionality um, that Steph mentioned and the multitude and complexities of identity and how we really have to use that to push forward to have these conversations, not in the abstract, but conversations here in real life, even if they're online here in our Zoom environment, the way that we have right now. Um, 
Uh, we'd also absolutely love to thank the audience for attending and asking questions. I think we'll wait a moment to see if we have any other Q and A's left. I don't believe we do. Um, hi, everyone again. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think a lot of the, what you all discussed was covered in such an awesome um, and fruitful conversation. So thank you so much, Stephanie and Bernadette for, you know, this conversation. I'm, I, I've been watching and I'm like, y'all make me so proud. <laughs> so, um, very, very happy and excited. But yes, thank you to the audience who have been able to join us this evening and for your questions. Um, I think they've been really awesome to like just reflect on, especially at AU as a PWI and things that we're doing in order to enhance and, you know, push our um, initiative and agenda for the students and the community to really have these authentic conversations. Um, you know, as Stephanie and Bernadette both alluded, Jen, like we teach, you know, not only a transition course in the fall for first year students, but the transition course in the spring focuses more on anti-racism, um, looking at power, privilege, and inequality. So these are conversations that, um, you know, we didn't have growing up um, in Massachusetts and I, in college either, and not for me where I went. So these are things that, um, you know, I kind of wish I had and very much in the book, like you noted, like a lot of these things I can pick and choose in some characters and some, you know, pieces that I'm like, sounds familiar. Um, but, uh, you know, at the same time, like I, you know, from a sister to a sister, I thank you also for writing this book for not only, you know, the voices of the, the Latino community, but also for our family, you know, that's really important as well. Um, so as a reminder to folks, um, I'm going to put in the chat again, the link to Politics and Prose, which is a local bookstore here in DC, where um, you can get a copy of this book, um, Don't Ask Me Where I'm From, by Jennifer DeLeon. I do believe they have a couple of signed copies as well. So if you're yes. in the, the checkout, I think you'll be able to get a signed copy. So um, shout out to that. Um, but we have been recording this video as well. So we'll also put that out there um, for folks who weren't able to attend um, and for the larger community to know. So please share widely um, as this has been an awesome conversation. So um, just kind of looking one more time if we have any questions, I don't believe we do, but. Um, well, thank you. I, I mean, Bernadette and Stephanie, this is so incredible. Like. I, Thank you for your questions and the way you ask them. You're pros. You are pros. You, so, <laughs> I'm just like, okay, we're going to stay in touch. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you, Jen, for your time. Um, and let us know, you know, how we can always continue to support the word and, um, you know, the character of Liliana, who I'm sure does exist out there. So We'll keep in touch that way but thank you everyone for joining us this evening um and we are hoping that you had a great time with us and we'll share widely uh look out for more events that we'll do in the future through first year advising and aux but have a great every have a great night everyone follow me on instagram oh yes yeah do you want to promote anything else that you're doing before <laughs> Um, I would say please yeah follow me on instagram you can put it in the chat if you want it's it's basically um, Delhi Jen, D-E-L-E-J-E-N. -E -E. And yeah. in March, my essay collection comes out. So um, I'll be in touch about that. But it's, it's called White Space. And it's about the white spaces I've occupied in my life in school, neighborhoods, communities, um, with friends, but also the white space of the page and how mm -hmm. my journey to, to becoming a writer. So mm -hmm. I will share that cover as soon as I have it with Caroline. And um, We'll have to get you copies of that too. So thank yeah. you everyone. Yeah, have a great night everyone. All right, bye. Thank you so much.